Good afternoon. My name is Dennis Hirsch, and I am a professor of law at the Moritz College of Law. And importantly for this event, I am faculty director of the Program on Data and Governance, a program of the Moritz College of Law and of the Translational Data Analytics Institute. The Program on Data and Governance, or as we like to call it, PDG, has a two-part mission. First, PDG conducts research on how to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of advanced analytics and AI. Second, it engages the community in the conversation about how we, how we can best govern advanced information technologies so that they vindicate rather than undermine our values. We do this in a number of ways, including through our data points lecture series in which you are participating today. A few decades ago, who would have thought that we would be living much of our lives online and that reams of our personal information could be collected so easily? And 10 years ago, who would have thought that companies and governments would be applying data analytics and AI to this information and so be even able to infer even more sensitive information about us? Today, we are much more aware of these technologies and have expanded the field of privacy law and policy to start to deal with the challenges they pose. But we are not at the end of earth-shaking, privacy-challenging technological innovation, far from it. In fact, the quantum era is just ahead of us and it will blow our minds and it will stress our law and policy frameworks in ways that most of us have not yet even begun to think about. Thankfully, there are a few people who have think hard about this, and one of them is our speaker today. Professor Chris Hufnagel has a forthcoming co-authored book on law and policy for the quantum age. And he is one of the leading thinkers about this emerging, fascinating, and vital area of law and policy. So we are truly lucky to have Chris, Chris with us today to share his vision of the challenges our quantum future may pose and how to address those challenges. Chris holds dual appointments at the UC Berkeley School of Information and at the Berkeley Bolt Hall School of Law, where he is faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology and professor of law in residence. Importantly for me, Chris is also co-founder of the Privacy Law Scholars Conference, the really central gathering place for academics who think about privacy law and policy. And so he has played a major role in building the field of privacy law as a type of academic study. Before I turn this over to Chris, I want to let you know that we could not have these conversations and support them without our partners, and in particular, the law firm of Porter Wright, Morrison Arthur is the partner that supports and makes possible this lecture series. And we thank Porter Wright for its vision in understanding the importance of these data governance issues and for its generous support of the Data Points lecture series. I also wanted to let you know that I'll be the moderator at today's event. So if you have questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A function to share them with me and I will then consolidate the questions and ask as many as we have time for to our speaker. With that, it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Chris, Chris Hufnagel to share his ideas with you. Thank you, Professor Hirsch. I am sorry that I'm not there in person today. As you know, we've talked about this event for about a year now, and I wanted to come visit uh, the campus and see you in person. And I also want to tell your colleagues uh, that, that you, Professor Hirsch, um, have been a very important actor in the privacy law field. And we've looked to you and your guidance to open up new vistas, um, in particular in thinking about property and environmental law approaches to privacy law. So it is an honor to get to have this opportunity to, to see you again um, and interact with your center. So thank you. Hope we can do it in person next time. I am going to talk about a 
a book project. And let me uh, let me just load my slides here and make sure they work. And I what I'd like to do is talk just for about 25 minutes about the book project and then switch to um, questions and um, discussion. So it looks like the slides are working. Um, so if you have questions, please uh, uh, please uh, pose them in the chat. We'd, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about this work. Um, the project I'm discussing today is, as Dennis Hirsch explained, a joint book project with my friend Simpson Garfinkel. Uh, Simpson is a well-known person in technology policy space. He currently works for the Census Bureau, but over the years he's held many appointments, including as tenured professor at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, Simpson is someone who knows a lot about a lot of things, and it's been a lot of fun to work on this book with him. Um, the book is about quantum technologies, and by that we mean technologies that use quantum effects, so technologies that deliberately use quantum effects to provide some type of utility. And we, we categorize these as technologies that provide greater measurement and sensing, uh, greater computing or new forms of computing maybe is a good way of putting it, and uh, new features in the communication space. So our whole world is indeed governed by quantum mechanics, but I don't consider uh, my headphones here to be a quantum object. We're only talking about technologies that, that are deliberately tuned to look at quantum level phenomena. The book, after introducing those technologies, discusses four possible scenarios for a future, a uh, quantum age future, if you will. And then we go into canvassing policy issues that can be brought about by quantum technologies. I do wanna point out a critical assumption in our work, and that is when technologists present something is entirely novel. It often is not. And um, in presenting a technology as novel, it has the effect of uh, uh, um, making it harder for us to think about historical analogs and how existing rules and existing uh, um, approaches might apply to the new technology. So we're very skeptical of the idea of novelty framing. And, and in our book, we point out a great deal that what what quantum technologies do is make certain capabilities better, but then we are very careful to highlight the capabilities that are brand new. And I'll do that a bit in this, in this presentation. So look forward here. Okay, so why talk about this now? What's so exciting about quantum technologies uh, rather than let's say 10 years ago? Well, a lot of things are happening in the field. For one, nation states are strongly investing, heavily investing in quantum information science and in applied research. Uh, both China and the European Union are major players in the field. No one owns quantum technologies. It's not like, let's say, computing or the atomic bomb, which are technologies that are uniquely uh, associated with the United States. And the goal of the European Union region and of China is to leapfrog US um, 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 technical might. Uh, they see quantum technologies as potentially like the internet was in the 1990s as a technology that can give their regions an asymmetric advantage in the world. There's a couple other things going on here. For one, there are certain quantum technologies that will greatly interfere with existing signals intelligence um, activities. And so there is a kind of going dark scenario uh, for, for signals intelligence from quantum technologies. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot going on in electronic warfare, and so, so the uh, one major purpose of uh, advancing quantum, te quantum technologies is to deal with advances, particularly from the Russian armed forces in electronic warfare capabilities. Um, we now know that, for instance, GPS jamming is widespread and uh, being used extensively by the Russians in, in some of their uh, activities. So we're looking for new technologies that can deal with things like GPS um, uh, jamming. The flip side of this is that quantum technologies um, might frustrate signals intelligence, but they also might heighten a different type of intelligence known as measurement and signals intelligence. And this is, you know, in, 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 in the easiest way to talk about this is these are a series of technologies that are often satellite based that can tell you about things on to terrestrial landscapes. 
quantum technologies could be very good for this. Um, and then finally, you know, why is this as exciting now? Part of it is, is this picture, these pictures right above my head here. I think that's going to work. Um, the tech is getting easier. So for instance, this uh, demonstration, this kit up here, the quantum eraser demonstration kit from Thor Labs costs about $3,000. And it implements a, um, an experiment that was state of the science just 10 years ago. So for just just $3,000, you can buy a device that you could show high school students or college students about a quantum experiment that could only be done in a laboratory just a decade ago. That's really impressive. And then in the commercial marketplace, we have uh, uh, products like this. Here we go, right there. Um, this is a device that creates random numbers based on quantum events. And therefore, you can make much stronger uh, um, encryption keys. Um, the company that makes this sells these devices online. You can buy them today with your credit card. You couldn't do that five years ago and 10 years ago. So why else um, is this exciting now? Companies are getting really interested in quantum technologies. When I survey the landscape, I see about 200 companies that have a significant focus in quantum technologies. Okay, so that's not just a little bit. That's, th those, are, those are companies that really are making quantum their, their focus. Um, so what are companies worried about? Companies are worried that quantum technologies could be a winner take all environment. And I'll explain how that could be. Um, there's a lot of challenges that companies face. Um, the United States is using a lot of export control on quantum technologies. So uh, it means our markets for quantum technologies are shrinking. The path to profit is unclear. And that's really tied to this next point, spotting quantum fluff. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are making really wild claims about what these technologies can do, but it is difficult to tell the difference between the good claims and the bad claims. And much of that has to do with the types of factors that um, are common to companies like Wire, uh, Wirecard, AG, and Theranos, where most of these companies are private. There's a lot of mystique around the technology. There's a lot of early investors who will make a lot of money. Um, even if the technology doesn't work, they'll make a lot of money if they can create hype around it. So figuring out a path to profit is not so easy. And of course, um, companies need a workforce that can actually use these technologies. And then finally, the government, our government, is interested in quantum technologies for the reasons I stated earlier about China and the European Union. And under President Trump, we vastly increased the amount of money we are investing in quantum technology research President Trump uh, uh, poured just over a billion dollars into the field. And that does not count Department of Defense funding, which is a little harder to track, but the Department of Defense allocates about $105 billion a year. Okay, that's three times as much as the National Institutes of Health for all sorts of different technologies. And a lot of that ends up in the quantum technology space. So um, how do we get from um, how do we get from the laboratory to um, to the commercial marketplace? Well, uh, one thing we have to do is pay attention to research in the field, and um, we can see one way I can I can show the, the nation state competition in this field is that nations are strongly funding basic research in quantum technologies. Uh, if, if you look at just the raw numbers. Uh, China has more papers published that are funded by the Chinese government in some way than the United States or the European Union. There's also some very interesting um, um, dynamics here. Um, in addition to the European Union, individual nation states in, the, in Europe, like Germany and the UK and the Netherlands, are major players in quantum technologies. And they have their own independent quantum technology research groups that, um, that are kind of playing um, a strategic game here, right? The, the European Union funding is about sovereignty and the regional advantage that these technologies can play. But when individual companies like Germany say, we're gonna pour $2 billion into quantum technologies as they did last year, um, what they are betting on is that collaborations with the United States and China might launch them ahead of other of other competitors. So we have a kind of regional sovereignty game being played and a nation state sovereignty game being played. So who's training? Many, many more people are training in quantum technologies. 
um, and the big uptick, this is moving up to the right pretty fast here, more and more of people are, are getting graduate training in, um, in, in QIS. And where is that training happening? It's happening in the United States, the United Kingdom, China, and Canada. These are um, some of the quantum technology powerhouses. The other ones are the Netherlands, interestingly, as a very um, muscular uh, research program in Germany. Um, and when you look at the institutions, it's the people you expect, MIT and the UC system that really dominate the, the, the field. Um, so let me talk about the three quantum technologies. Um, the first, and I present it first for several different reasons. I present it first because um, it's the most important, but also the most basic form of quantum technology. So quantum sensing has been around since the 1940s or 1950s in the form of um, uh, medical imaging. Uh, devices like the MRI are quantum sensing devices. But what's exciting now, what we call the second generation quantum sensors, um, do uh, sensing at, at, at higher resolution and sense some things that previously couldn't be sensed. So we know that MRIs sense MRI devices sense magnetic fields, but there are also exciting developments in quantum sensors that detect gravity waves, waves, and quantum sensors that detect photonic emission. Um, so uh, why is this important? Well, if you want to build a quantum computer, you need quantum sensors. You could almost think of a quantum computer as a quantum sensor array. But before we even get to computing, we could think about all sorts of really exciting applications in the quantum sensing place. We argue that this is the killer app of quantum technologies. It's not that we're just going to be able to see more and see further. We're going to be able to do new things with quantum technologies, some of which are somewhat scary. Um, so there'll be all the medical stuff. This is great. This is what will make our life better. Um, but in electronic warfare, there will be new devices. There, they already exist. Uh, PNT, this is position, navigation, and timing devices. Think of GPS that are resistant to jamming. And these devices um, can be used underwater and without any range of the sky. Um, so that means that you could do underground navigation with them. And you can see how this could be very important for submarine navigation and how you might want to put these devices in uh, weapon systems and the like so that anti-jamming um, anti technologies fail as, as, the, as the weapon travels. There are very interesting developments in um, quantum radar and sonar. They're actually very different technologies, completely different technologies. We assess that quantum sonar is probably real and probably works, and this could be destabilizing. It is indeed a strategic development because with a quantum sonar sensor, um, you know, if you think about a submarine, it, its stealth is based on Archimedean principles of water displacement. You don't see a submarine in the ocean. However, if you can train a sensor that can detect disturbances in electro electromagnetic fields, you can detect the heavy metals and electronics inside, um, um, inside a submarine. Um, quantum radar looks like it might be harder to, uh, to achieve uh, than it's thought, but the idea with quantum radar is that you use a principle known as quantum ent um, entanglement to send photons out into the sky in the microwave um, band, and you send um, a, a one photon out, oh, well, millions of photons out, and you retain copies, in, in essence, of those photons that are entangled. And the idea is, is that if those photons hit an object in the sky, the photons that you retain will indicate that uh, something has happened. Um, so this is a technology that, if it works, um, would have big implications for low observables, meaning stealth technologies. Um, there's also really, uh, really um, exciting or scary developments in mining. And so, Dennis, I expect you to ask a question about this. <laughs> um, companies like the Beers, Schlumberger, are, um, have de developed techniques where they can tow a quantum sensor over um, land. And that's what's happening with this helicopter here. It's towing a sensor that can detect minerals below the surface. And indeed, in this experiment, the, um, the authors show that they can detect 
iron balls about the size of my fist that are buried more than a meter underground um, uh, without any digging. So that's going to mean something. Um, quantum computing is the area that people are most excited about. However, it really is the furthest away, the hardest to achieve. There's a couple of things I want you to know about quantum computing. The first is the state of the science. And when I use that term, state of the science, what I mean is the cutting edge. What I mean is what's happening in research labs, whereas state of the art would be what's happening in the commercial marketplace. State of the science is still research device. These devices are not really ready to, to be um, out there in the world providing commercial utility, number one. So we are in um, experimental phase. Number two, quantum computers, contrary to what is uh, said in the media, are not magic. Uh, they don't um, uh, contemplate all solutions to a problem and then just spit out the answer. That's not how they work. Instead, very smart uh, mathematicians and physicists have discovered algorithms. Um, literally, the word used is discovered rather than written, okay, to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, that can solve hard problems, problems that are hard for existing computers in ways with, uh, that require fewer steps. And so this is the big threat to encryption, the idea that a quantum computer would be able to implement an algorithm that a classical computer cannot and get a speed up. That's still theoretical. No one has used a quantum computer to uh, factor a number that has significance in a strategic sense. Finally, I want to point out that quantum computing was launched by um, uh, Feynman in his uh, beautiful speech um, uh, uh, predicting the, uh, uh, the idea that we need to build computers based on the principles of quantum physics in order to answer the most basic challenges in botany, biology, chemistry, physics, and so on. So that's the Feynman idea of the quantum computer as a physics sim simulator. This is actually the most um, likely scenario for the development of quantum computers. Uh, uh, devices like uh, the one pictured here um, um, that is currently the most uh, powerful quantum computer built. Um, this quantum computer simulates a physical pro process and provides an answer to a very difficult uh, um, problem. So in Feynman's vision is one, a very beautiful future, a future where we figure out energy problems, a future where the world becomes more efficient. Um, but it's also the winner take all scenario, because if you are able to make fundamental advances in material science and chemistry and the like, you might be able to figure out how to build a bigger quantum computer. And at that point, we're off to the races. Whoever can do that first simulation gets the next bigger quantum computer. They do more simulations. They get more insights in how to manage quantum states. Then they get a bigger computer and so on. And this is the strategy of Google and IBM and the like. If, uh, if you read their white papers, what they are working on are fundamental discoveries in fields like material science, not in encryption. Um, and then the final uh, quantum technology I wanna talk about, I'm a little behind on time, so I'll speed up here, is quantum communications. And this, is, um, this actually relates to two different uh, capabilities. One is the use of quantum states. Typically, this is uh, photons and the alignment of those photons to create stronger encryption keys. And in fact, those encryption keys once made uh, basically cannot be broken even by a quantum computer. Here again, the state of the science advance is in China, where um, uh, John Wei Pan's um, uh, group has actually implemented a working quantum key distribution network with 150 users that spans 4,000 kilometers. It is absolutely the, the, the biggest in the world, and it's actually in use. Um, so on one hand, you can use this technology to make better encryption keys, therefore more secure communication against future attackers. On the other hand, if you can master quantum sensing, you would be able to use quantum states to actually communicate. That is, to send messages to other people, you would use photons that were aligned um, um, in, in certain positions to signal a one or a zero. 
And this would make your communication truly end to end, because let's say I let's say I generate um, uh, millions and millions of photons and I make a message that I send to Dennis. Only Dennis would possess that message. He, Dennis alone, would possess the photons that made up my message. If anybody intercepted some of those photons, Dennis would realize it. He would be able to measure the uh, state of those photons and say, "Aha! Someone has." Has, um, has listened in, but here's the key strategic advantage. In this end-to-end -end communications um, 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 approach, metadata surveillance goes away. You can't engage in metadata surveillance. This is the most important, most strategic aspect of this type of communication. It would literally cause the going dark that the SIGINT communities are so worried about. So, um, after discussing these three different technologies, we discussed policy, policy scenarios. Um, let me just mention two of them in, in a little of detail. One is the idea that a government runs away with the quantum computing um, um, advantage. It could be China, could be the United States, but they build a large quantum computer and then they enjoy all the benefits of that device and can deny those, deny benefits to other people. So this is a situation where a government has, let's say, powers to decrypt, but can deny citizens the same um, um, ability. Another scenario we actually think is more likely, given um, the historical context of quantum technologies, is a public-private scenario, one where state of the science adva advances are made in the private sector in parallel with the public sector. This is a much leakier scenario. This is a scenario where more quantum technologies become commercialized. And in fact, we think this is a brighter scenario for humanity because the companies developing these quantum technologies are gonna wanna use them for things like drug development uh, rather than the types of reasons that um, governments wanna use computers, very kind of different use cases. Think back to the history of computing uh, computing was inc incubated by the military for two primary reasons. One was to calculate artillery tables and the other was to do analysis against things like the German Enigma machine and against the Russian um, surveillance of, of, of the United States and so on. That's what really drove the, class of, the development of classical computing. If we have a public-private scenario, I think we'll have um, drug discovery uh, botany, biology, chemistry be the drivers instead of military drivers. Um, so policy at the high level. When people talk about quantum computing, they talk about the end of privacy. I, I think they've got it completely wrong. First of all, the end of privacy, if it happens, <laughs> it will come from quantum sensing, not from quantum computing, because uh, as these sensors get smaller and so on, you'll be able to put them on UAVs and you'll be able to do things like peer through people's roofs to see if they have weapons and, and the like. Quantum computing's use for cryptanalysis is always is also more difficult than stated in the media. We're not close to it being possible, not in the next 10 years, maybe not for many decades. The bigger threat from quantum computing is a loss of, of our humanity. It's a world where computers can figure out more and more difficult problems and humans are needed less and less for their useful work. So I'm kind of trying out this purple part. This is straight out of our book. An inevitable downside of quantum sensing is privacy violations. The downside is a future where we make ourselves irrelevant by creating um, inventions that we can't even understand. So that's what I think the strategic surprises. Um, a couple other, um, uh, you know, I'll take it down a notch here. Um, other things we need to pay attention to from a policy perspective, one is virtuous cycles. How do we sculpt an economy and an innovation landscape so that quantum technologies get bigger and bigger and more and more powerful in the same way that personal computers have become uh, less expensive, ubiquitous, and more and more powerful in ways we could never have, never have imagined. Um, related to that is whether there is a winner-take-all risk in quantum technologies. I explained how that could happen in quantum computing, and I do think it is a real risk. Um, one reason is that almost all the companies that are working in um, quantum computing 
are seeking cloud deployments. And on one hand, you could say, well, that's great. It, that means quantum computing will be democratized. It means I could go to amazon.com and rent access to a quantum computer, beautiful. Um, the other side of that is, is that the engineering of the quantum computer stays locked inside a, a vault inside the, um, the quantum computing, excuse me, the cloud computing facility. And so the cloud computing may cause democratization, but it also allows developers of these technologies to keep their engineering secret. Um, so that's a really important point. I have more details on that. I could talk about other things that are pretty obvious. Secrecy, export controls are very important to whether we are able to innovate in this field. If you look at um, Professor Pond's quantum computer, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that most of the parts of it are made by Thor Labs. That's an American company. Um, so that innovation is one that stands on the shoulders of um, uh, uh, physicists who've worked in optics for decades and who have commercialized their technologies and sell them. Literally, you can buy them on the web. We want to keep that open marketplace. Um, we want to preserve that open marketplace, I think. Diversity is also very important. Um, if you look at the different research groups in quantum technologies, they are very international. And that's because no nation, not even China, has the domestic talent pool to create the people who can do this research. Yes, it's that hard. And even in China, um, when we uh, spoke with Yanwei Pan, he told us that uh, his even his, um, um, his lab is, is very internationally focused. I know I mentioned um, openness, so let me focus on industrial policy. Um, contrary to what the Silicon Valley people say, Silicon Valley is a creation of the federal government. The federal taxpayer built Silicon Valley. Google and all these other companies that, that claim to be so libertarian and so on wouldn't exist without the federal government, without the, the, the American taxpayer uh, that created the landscape of Silicon Valley. The same is true in quantum computing. The, it, we, we're not going to be able to build these devices on the commercial marketplace alone. It's going to require taxpayer support. Um, there's strategic competition issues. We could talk about these in the q and I don't want to go over my time. Um, uh, but there's a lot of really interesting things that can happen in, in state conflict. Um, and uh, we could find ourselves in a world where it becomes very hard to, um, let's say, hide weapons using camouflage, using um, netting and so on to hide um, uh, to hide tanks and the like. Uh, these are going to be increasingly observable with quantum technologies. And, and um, part of the strategic issue there is these technologies are more powerful if they are space implemented. So nations that have both a quantum um, uh, program and a space program can do more than ones that just have terrestrial um, um, uh, capabilities. Um, so that means that we're going to have to think more about anti-satellite conflict, and indeed, um, we're, we're already um, seeing that. And there's another kind of scary strategic competition issue out there. Um, just as you can use um, quantum, you, just as a likely use of a quantum computer will be to figure out how to do things like fix nitrogen more efficiently. Um, you know, something like 3% of the world's energy is used on um, creation of fertilizer and enriched uh, nitrogen products. Well, one of the first things you do with a compu quantum computer is try to figure out how to do that with less energy. But of course, if you can fix nitrogen with a, um, a more efficiently with a quantum computer, you could also make nitrogen weapons. And we might um, think about how the technology could be used to make new biological, chemical, um, synthetic, and DNA weapons. Um, and all in the kind of privacy of a computer rather than a facility where these things are grown much easier to detect. Um, so um, let's see, I hope my slide isn't frozen there. Um, and then finally, you know, one big uh, critical assumption in our book and one of the things we talk about a lot is the idea that technologies are political artifacts. Technologies can cause societies to have to reorganize their politics around the technology itself. There's no better example than that, that, of that than the atom bomb and nuclear power. And of course, the problem with those technologies, as is the problem with early classical computing, is that really only governments have these technologies. 
and governments use these technologies for the um, uh, the goals that governments have. Um, so we do risk if if quantum technologies are not democratized um, and don't have controls around them, we could end up in a world where there is a quantum taboo, where these technologies are associated with um, government misuse and government power rather than the um, empowerment of humanity, which I actually think we could realize with these technologies. And so with that, I want to say thank you. I will stop my screen share and I'm really looking forward to any questions debate um, um, that you have. Uh, please tell me if I've got anything wrong. I'd love to change my manuscript now rather than later. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Chris. That was a fascinating talk. Wow. And really covering a wide array of new capabilities and new issues um, give us a lot to think about for a while to come. Um, I invite people again to put your um, put your questions into the Q&A um, and so I can share them with Chris. Here's, here's one question, Chris, um, and I'll just read it. We need to assume that governments will have quantum computing before it becomes a standard civilian product. You ended your talk with this. Thus, won't there be a terrifying period where civilian networks will be completely defenseless against cyber attacks using quantum computing from state actors? And what does that portend given what we've seen state actors do with civilian networks in the past, either you know, your own state or, 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 or other states? I think you're muted, Chris. You need to unmute. There you go. Sorry about that. I lost my cursor. I lost my mouse. Yeah. Um, so um, you could think of several different cyber related attacks that you might be able to optimize in with a quantum computer. Um, so one is the cryptanalysis threat. So um, people think about that in the sense of individual messages. However, if you, you know, if you have a quantum computer, this is going to be a very expensive device. The estimate is that cracking a single RSA uh, uh, key will take 24 to 28 hours. So if you think about it from the perspective of an intelligence agency, you have tasking and you have to think about key value. So you're not gonna you're not gonna break into my email, okay? You're gonna break into much more important things, and you're going to use those attacks in certain ways that pay off, that are worth 24 hours of compute time. So what are those? Um, to me, it's it's breaking the so software signatures is the highest value type of attack you might levy. So if you could break the signature for um, some silly program that millions of people have downloaded. Um, you could push an update and then you're inside their device. And th that would be how I would use um, um, this capability for um, attack. You could also imagine increasing um, use of machine learning, learning to target individual attacks. Now you could do this with classical computers already, um, but you could imagine um, uh, using quantum computers to make models that then could be used on classical computers to optimize attacks. And those attacks could be against networks or people in the sense of phishing attacks even. Um, the, you know, the good news about the first issue, the cryptanalysis, is that we are, I think, at least 10 years away from, from this. No one can paint a clear path to where we're going to get to large scale cryptanalysis with quantum computing. Too many fundamental challenges need to be um, need to be resolved first. Interesting, thank you. Um, another interesting question here. Um, at Ohio State, we've been doing a, a bunch of work on um, AI ethics and data ethics connected to advanced analytics and AI. And so the questioner asks, the dangers and risks you've outlined are very similar to the dangers and risks of AI, which lead to conversations of trust, ethics, human AI partnerships, et cetera. Where do you see these aspects, trust, ethics, et cetera, instantiated with respect to quantum computing? Is it similar to AI or is, or is it fundamentally different? And if it's different, how so? 
it, so I think it, so that's a great question. There is a lot of overlap. We could see quantum technologies as um, a, a key enabling tech, um, uh, uh, capability to get to artificial general intelligence. So in the way that would work, the, the way you might see that happen is um, using quantum sensing to see deeper into the brain um, uh, to, to um, literally copy information in the brain. Um, a lot of things need to happen for that to work. Um, so quantum, quantum sensing is part of the, the AGI path. And then um, uh, with quantum computing, if you can build a large device, you would be able to get, you would be able to make sense of um, data sets with higher and higher dimensionality. Um, so do you make, do these twin um, um, uh, capabilities lead to a place where you start making machines that are more and more capable and then more and more capable than people. And I think I, I didn't really highlight this in the slide, but I, um, I think there's this incredible, this great insight made by Harari and Homo Deus that we're, we're so infatuated of this idea of computer sentience, but actually you don't need sentience. What you need is capability. And most, if, if a computer or a robot, can be capable. We actually don't care if it is intelligent. And capable robots will begin to uh, replace our functions, our, our ability to work, our ability to fight, and so on. The, the things that give us value in an economic society. So I think that the conversation has to go beyond ethics to one. I don't really see a path. It's up to embrace something like the European human rights framework and to start thinking about um, basic rights to rather than rights from. So in a world where you can't work for Uber anymore because there's a robot driving the taxi and you can't be an accountant because you know what, they figured out how to do it all in a computer. And you know, you really can't be much of a lawyer anymore either that the world begins, that our economic world begins to shrink and we're, we're gonna care less about freedom from and we're gonna want freedoms to income, education, and a, a reasonable life. So that's where I think the conversation should go. The ethics, the problem with the ethics conversation is you gotta think about the scenario of the first quantum computer being built at, let's say Sandia National Lab. And for um, a military. And, and the ethical trade-offs are gonna be completely different. The, 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 where you know where the lines are drawn. So, um, I mean, you talked about a world without lawyers. So now you're really scaring me. Um, <laughs> you might be making other people feel good, but but as a legal educator, you're, you're frightening me. Um, but you talked about you know kind of rights to rather than rights from. Of course, that is not how the U.S legal system and our constitution, which is generally a constitution of negative rights, tends to work. So, you know, kind of will that require a reframing and a rethinking for us? Related to that, we have another a question on, on really that same topic, um, which is, you know, we're still shaping the legal framework for cloud technologies and other data technologies. Mm -hmm. Do you think that as lawmakers do that, they should be thinking about quantum technologies now and shaping a legal framework around privacy, around competition, et cetera. Or do we need to wait for these technologies to develop and to understand them better and see how they're gonna be used before we start to regulate them? Yeah, so that question goes to really a, a core set of assumptions and arguments in the book where we, we point out that you know, American history has had this we think unfortunate tendency to wait for a technology to arrive and then say, okay, now we got to do cleanup. Sometimes we don't do the cleanup um, and we often become inured to the privacy violations, the other types of problems that come from the technology. Um, here's another example where we're looking to a European human rights framework to, to think about those issues. And if the Europe, under the European um, um, uh, Charter for Human Rights, there is a framework that requires governments 
to get legal authority to use technologies before those technologies are used on citizens. And so if you want to, you know, whether you're going to use wiretapping or some type of new sensing, you have to have a national law that discusses the technology that explains its capabilities so that the citizen is put on notice about government power. And then the use of that technology has to be proportionate to the criminal justice goal. This is a really, I mean, it's a great framework. Uh, you know, we, you know, in the US, we have the situation where basically, you know, basically military technologies eventually end up in the possession of local law enforcement. And then one day we read about it in the New York Times, and maybe five years later, there's a Supreme Court case saying, no, maybe you shouldn't be aiming heat detecting technology into people's homes. Or no, maybe you shouldn't be building fake cell phone towers that can intercept everyone's cell phone <laughs> and then, and then uh, their location. Uh, the Euro under the European framework, you don't even get there. Before, before the police use a technology like that, they have to have a framework in place and they have to use it proportionately to criminal goals. Um, so I, I think that both prongs are, are, are very important interventions. And, European courts have um, made decisions that have uh, real traction. Um, a recent court in the United Kingdom threw out a facial recognition system that was being used in public. Okay, so for, for us in the US, it'd be too bad, so sad. Police using face recognition in public, too bad for you. You stay in your home is, is the answer. Well, the UK court said, no, you can't do this. You can't do it for general cr criminal deterrence. You could do it in response to a specific threat. Okay, so a specific crime you have in your head, you could do it. And not only that, before you deploy this technology, you have to prove to us that it's not racially discriminatory. That, I mean, I think those are the types of frameworks we need to start thinking about implementing. They're technology neutral and um, they are information forcing so that the citizen can um, um, have a say in how the technologies are deployed. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions about kind of competition and, you know, keeping markets open and competition among na nation states. Let me just see if I can link a few of them together. So, you know, you talked about wanting an open marketplace or, um, yeah, sharing information with respect to quantum technologies. How do you think about that in the current landscape? where US government has concerns about foreign influence and in research. And I'll add yeah. where in China, for example, you know, advanced data technologies are being used for surveillance in support of an authoritarian government, um, you know, talk about human rights. Uh, on a related note, uh, kind of on the market side, um, somebody picked up on your example of um, creating nitrogen using quantum technologies and would that effectively you know become a printing press for the company that's able to do that because they can create something of so much value and they'd have so much capital then that they could just dominate many markets do we need to worry about that so both on the you know these questions about kind of competition monopoly power um, sharing or not sharing both on the nation state level and on the market level. You know, the, let me pick on the nitrogen fixation example. I mean, the, the current process we use for to fix nitrogen is a century old. And if you've ever looked at a photograph of um, one of those plants, it's uh, not the best for the environment. <laughs> um, so if we could find any way to optimize uh, that process, it would be good, better for the environment. Uh, we could probably feed more people and yes, people are going to make billions of dollars and first movers are going to make a ton of money. I think one, you know, the way a company would get there is you would use your quantum computer to create models that cannot be created on a classical computer because the underlying model is um, of sufficient complexity that a, that a um, classical computer could not solve the problem associated with it. But once you've made that model, um, you could run it on a classical computer. And so um, the principle is a lot like Sudoku. Like when you play Sudoku, solving the puzzle is really hard and it takes hard work. 
but verifying that the puzzle is correct is, is super easy. There's a, there's a similar metaphor here between quantum and classical computers. So if you could develop, um, let's say the model of how a drug diffuses in a, um, a person of a certain age and a certain gender um, and so on, um, you, could you could sell that model um, to everyone under the sun, every drug company and so on to test their drugs um, in this model on classical computers. So I think there'll be a tremendous marketplace for people to solve problems, whether it's nitrogen fixation, whether it's how drugs um, 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 uh, are, are absorbed in every type of body. You know, the, the difference between my body and your body, we could imagine models for, for that. So there's, a, there's, uh, th there's lots of fish to kill here. <laughs> uh, there's a, um, I, I think like in machine learning, um, you could think about machine learning through a, um, um, a, a competition lens, but we, we live in a world where there are so many data sets. There's so many different ways to make money in machine learning. I think the same will be true in, uh, with quantum computers. So many different problems that you could focus on and you'd have to become deeply expert in. You wouldn't be able to make a model of how uh, a drug diffuses in someone's body without having um, biologists. Uh, you couldn't just do that as a computer scientist. So I, I do see a kind of a, a broad um, ability of, of different people to make money in the marketplace. But then the question becomes, does um, do, do just a small number of companies actually have the devices that can make those models? Interesting. We have a couple of questions about people who want to learn, you know, uh, yeah. from people who want to learn more about this area or want to think about, you know, how we can develop the human capital and do the education to, so that people can still be useful in, in, in this quantum age. So on a very practical level, um, are there resources that you would rec recommend people look at today, non-technical people, you know, to understand this better? When is your book coming out, yeah. that question. Um, uh, and, and also, you know, how do you see education? Like what should people be learning? What will they need to learn to be valuable in this age? Okay, well, so thank you for that question. My book is almost done. And the cool thing is, is that we are open accessing it. Cambridge is doing a, um, a green open access license. So the whole book will be free online. Um, uh, you know, production, all that. Type. If you want to read today, like, it, you know, the most authoritative reports that that are low on hype are produced by the National Academies. In, in particular, there's one report called Quantum Computing um, uh, prospects and it might be called prospects and possibilities. It came out in 2018. It's free online on the National Academies website. It was written by a committee of deep experts on quantum computing, and I think that's one of the best writings out there um, for um, for this field. It only it really only deals with computing, whereas our book is mostly about sensing. Um, so so there are free and good good things out there. Um, um, on the education, there is a government, so President Trump created a committee to create a K-12 to curriculum. Um, I, it, it's, it's a little thin, um, but, but it's out there and you can read its high level bullet points. I mean, I think there's a couple things we should think about. I mean, one is, should we teach quantum mechanics to children before we teach them classical mechanics? It's like... Uh, I don't know, um, but it's, it seems like something we should think about. And I don't, to my knowledge, no one does that. You learn classical mechanics and only the most gifted students go on to learn um, uh, quantum mechanics. So maybe we should flip that. I don't know. Um, another relates to institutions like yours and mine. And that is, should we create departments of quantum technology, quantum information science? And my instinct is no. And the reason why is that when we do these broad literature uh, searches and we look at who's publishing and so on, um, the field is too diverse for an academic department. You, there are very important papers that are written in the field that are by physicists, by computer scientists, <laughs> by chemists. Um, and, and then in physics itself, you have the optics people versus the theory people and so on. 
it's hard to see what kind of department could unify all of this. And then, of course, you have the information theory people like me. And I can't understand. I can hardly understand <laughs> these other people. So I think with the, the future at, at academic institutions is going to be centers that create incentives for multidisciplinary research. But it doesn't, it doesn't look like a departmental fix. Chinese, however, are creating single institutions that will focus on this, this these types of technologies. Um, I'm just going to read this question. Uh, talking about when you're talking about rights to rather than rights from, I guess this is our last question. We're almost out of time. And yeah. people should know uh, because of the, the format of these webinars, we literally end at one o'clock. Um, and, uh, and you'll just think so just kind of be cut off. So apologies for the abruptness, but that's what we have to do. But the question is, um, in the book, the second machine age, the authors talk about in the future with faster computers, etc. It's going to increase the gap between the wealthy and the poor. It sounds from the inaccessibility and high investment needed to access and use these technologies that might increase that gap even more. What do what does this mean for inequality? How might we prevent the worst um, implications of that? I, I, this is a, the, the point is, it's a profound point. We are beginning to have concentration of computing power, right? So we're beginning to live in a world where we can't perceive things in the same way as like, I have eyes just like yours and so on. But um, a company like Google or a company like Amazon or, I, or IBM have increasing ability to make sense of the world in ways that we can never make sense of the world. They'll be able to look at evidence in ways that we'll never be able to, even if we're computer programmers, even if we're really, we're really technical. So there is a, um, in the kind of Shoshana Zuboff um, uh, flavor, there is this question we have, to re we have to reconcile of who gets to know what because if it if if that if the answer to that question is whoever has the best computers, <laughs> we're in trouble, right? You and me are in trouble. <laughs> and but you know the the kind of um, the Larry Pages of the world, um, with their conception of ethics, are going to have more ability to see and understand and make sense of the world. Chris, uh, we are out of time. This has been a fascinating talk. I think we could all probably sit and listen to you for another hour. Um, it's been so interesting. Thank you for you know, sharing what you've been learning and thinking about um, with our community. And thanks to each of our audience members for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at future Data Points events. We also have a fascinating distinguished lecture on big data law and policy that will be coming up in April. So, um, you know, watch your email for notice of that. Um, and thanks all for joining us today for this really interesting talk. Thank you.